Joe Rogan. Dr. Robert Sapolsky. Let's talk about toxoplasmosis. Protozoan parasite. 50% of population. It reproduces in the gut of cats. Comes out in the cat feces. Dash feces are eaten by rodents. Dash cat eats rodent. Now it has evolved and go to the brain of rodents and wipes out the innate fear that have of cat smells, and even some rats like the smell. It rewired them sexually. Yes, it crosses some circuitry in the hypothalamus. That cat pheromones that used to active alarm circuit in their limbic system, now instead taps into sexual arousal pathways. When they smell cat pheromones, they increase testosterone production. It makes cat pee smell sexy. How does that work? The parasite is in the world of behavioral manipulation of the hosts, for their own benefit. Like a rabid dog. The virus affects the nervous system of the dog, it's now rabid and more likely to bite with viral particles in its saliva which passes to the next individual. Something about fear, aversion, and neurobiology of attraction, it seems to involve a gene that's pertinent to the dopamine system in mammals, dopamine is a neurotransmitter about pleasure. So, it manipulating the reward system in rodents. On chimp. The toxin makes them less afraid of the smell of leopards. It's only for cats. Chimps still have aversion to snakes and other things. Yes, it's remarkably specific. Rodents lose a little of the general skittishness, a but disinhibited behaviorally, more exploratory, more likely to get eaten, not scared of cat pheromones. I read that there's a disproportionate amount of successful soccer teams that are in countries with high rates of infection of toxoplasma. There are two branches of toxin in humans. One it seems to increase the risk of schizophrenia. Individuals who have antibodies against toxo. In the past their body was dealing with it. Who had cats growing up, or whose mother had cats during pregnancy. It can attack nervous system badly. And a subtle version it's a sleeper effect of increasing the risk of schizophrenia. Two subtle changes in personality. In neuropsychological profiles get a little disinhibited. More likely to die in a car accident involving reckless speeding. Toxo infected plus depressed equals more likely to impulsively commit suicide. I saw you talked about a disproportionate amount of motorcycle victims. There's a high rate of toxo that you find in organs from people in accidents like that. What about in women? It has less severe effects of neuropsychological profiles. Nonetheless. Animals have evolved to be really good at picking up signals that somebody else is unhealthy. Like a potential mate is unhealthy. By sickness behavior, olfactory cues. That's what happen in rodents. But with toxo. A toxo infected male rodent, smells more attractive to female rodents. When mating, toxin gets into the sperm, so it can be transmitted to the female. It has elements of parasitism and symbiosis. So. Downside, you're more likely to get eaten by a cat. Upside, you're more likely to pass on copies of your genes. Another example of this type of viruses. Barnacles. It affects their reproductive system. The barnacle digs a hole so the parasite lay eggs. Or the aquatic worm that infects the grasshopper makes it commit suicide. Or the wasp that gets into cockroaches and takes their nervous system. Or how we have turned wolves into dog. Hormone oxytocin. Mother-infant bonding. Peer bonding in monogamous species. Makes you more trusting, expressive, generous. And. When you and your dog stare into each other's eyes, you both secrete oxytocin. We are doing this weird oxytocin with other species. Like 20.000 years ago, we hijacked this ancient neuroendocrinology about parental behavior, and now it's a symbiotic thing that we and dogs co-evolved. What about in relationships? It strengthens monogamous bonds. Oxytocin by binding to an oxytocin receptor. There's a gene for the oxytocin receptor with different variants. If you have one particular variant. That's associated with oxytocin having less effectively moves in your nervous system, which is associated with less stable relationships. None of this is deterministic. Does it apply to platonic friendships? Yes, that's got something to do with oxytocin. How many of these systems are manipulating human behavior? The frontal cortex. It's the most recently evolved. It's more complicated in us than any other species. It makes you do the harder thing, when it's the right thing to do, self-control, long-term planning, gratification, postponement, emotional regulation. We've got temptations and impulses. So, it's the critical juncture between an inane impulsive and tough it out. And what affects how well your frontal cortex is working? Like. How hungry you're. If you're hypoglycemic, how tired you're, how pain you feel. If you're our male, your testosterone levels make the frontal cortex sluggish and stupid. If you were traumatized in the previous five months because sustained stressful levels. How many stress levels you were exposed from your mother when you were a fetus. How many mislead were as a child. All the biological forces shaping you since you born. 
Kids' socioeconomic status is predictor of how much frontal cortex development there is. If you were raised in poverty on the average your stress hormone levels are higher, so the frontal cortex is thinner and not well developed. And at age 5 the gap in relation to other kids increase. Does Toxo have something to do with the frontal cortex? Sort of impulsive behavior. Is either due to a stronger biology of impulsiveness, or the is this such a great idea? Is the realm of the frontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex isn't fully online until you're like 25? Yes 25, no wonder why we do stupid things before that. It's uniform with male and women? Female development maturation figures faster. Adolescents have a brain going full blast, especially dopamine system with reward, sensation seeking, novelty. And a frontal cortex that's like half-baked at that point which is not very good at controlling impulses. Two implications. One legal implications, the driving force around the Supreme Court saying you can't execute somebody for a crime they did before 18. Because their frontal cortex isn't quite there yet. So, they've to be judged differently. Two most of your cortex is doing fine by the time you're 3 to 5 years old. And they're the frontal cortex taking 20 years to develop. And you might think, it's just like a tougher construction project. But no. Because we've been selected to have the delay. You want a frontal cortex that spends a long time learning. By definition if this is the last part of the brain to wire up, it's the part of the brain that's most sculpted by experience and environment, and least constrained by genes. It does socially appropriate context learning. And makes sense. Because every culture has culture-specific mores and situational ethics, which is so complicated. As young adult you're learning all the subtleties for appropriate behavior. To do the harder and the right thing, and what actually counts as the right thing. The part of your brain. To incorporate your society's rules as to when it's okay to lie. When not to lie. And when you decide you're going to lie, how to do it effectively. There's another animal that does delay reward? Yes. The dopamine system, the reward system, the interactions with the frontal cortex. Rodents can do that. If I press this lever once I get a reward. And if I press it three times faster, I get a greater reward, they go that way. But we do delayed gratification. Studying hard to get a good SAT, PhD, work, etc. We do delayed gratification to take 60 years. Or even doing delayed gratification that will come after life. So maybe even religious rules or ethical guidelines can be scaffolding for the frontal cortex. Absolutely, the rules that count as the right thing, and what count as the harder thing. Did you say it's the most recent thing, how's that? It's the most recently evolved part of the brain. The cortex that does more abstract stuff. It's not until mammals that you start seeing frontal cortex. And recently evolved the last 50 to 100 million years. It's particularly large in apes. A bit larger and wired in us. You studied baboons troop. Which were eating human garbage, and became accustomed to it. And the male changed in their behaviors. Where the dominant males got sick from tuberculosis. First, how do you study baboons? 33 straight summers. I go back to the same animals, camp under the same areas. And I study stress, health. What stress does taught a brain? Trying to make sense of what does your social rank and personality and patterns of social affiliation have to do with which baboons have the rotten cholesterol levels, high blood levels, who's healthy. I go watch them endlessly, knowing their personal lives. And I anesthetize the baboons and do the same clinical work you would do on a human. Cardiovascular functions. To how their health or disease has their stress physiology related to aspects of behavior. For the first 10 years. If you want to be a healthy baboon with minimal stress-related diseases you want to be high-ranking. But something more interesting. If you want to be a high-ranking or a baboon with a lot of stable affiliate of relationships, friends are going to be better for your health. How often you sit and groom. How often you're in contact. How often you're playing with infants. So, they eat human food, it changed their behavior, they weren't getting up early and foraging, they just waited in the trash for food, the fight for the dominance of the dump, till the point they got really sick. Yes they got high cholesterol level. Borderline diabetes. Subcutaneous fat. Parasite in their stomachs. At some point my troop knew about this dump. So, in the mornings about half males for the troop would pick up and run the garbage. Other thing, in the morning, baboons socialize, they sit, groom, gossip before they go out and do their foraging. So, if in the mornings instead of doing this, you're fighting for garbage food with another troop it means you're not very socially affiliated. After some years, there was a tuberculosis outbreak because some food had it. Which killed baboons in a couple of weeks. So now you only have 2 colon 1 female to male ratio. The key thing is the baboons who were left are the nice guys, those socially affiliated, least aggressive. If you're an aggressive baboon and you're having a bad day, 
you find somebody smaller and weaker and make his life impossible. So, as a much nicer troop, they were at much higher rates of grooming, making contact, etc. But most interesting. Ten years later, the troop is still like that. Still being less aggressive and more socially affiliated. When baboons are adolescent they wander around until they find a new troop. So, when new adolescents come to this troop. The older baboons teach to the joining baboons how to behave in this troop. Which it takes about six months for them to learn. They're less subject to resident males dumping on them. Because there's less displacement aggression to females by this new male, thus they're more relaxed, lower stress hormone, more affiliated with the news. You're a new adolescent male and show up in a typical troop and it's like 80 days before some female grooms you. In this troop it was like 3 days. You treat the news nicer and they calm down. Cultural transmission non-genetic transmission. From behavior to the next generation. Baboons are high aggressive, male dominance, hierarchical stricture societies. And it took them one generation of a radical circumstance and you see a completely new baboon behavior never seen before. It's the first time you've seen a primate behave like this. This is the biggest cultural shift that someone has seen in a baboon troop. And that someone says that there's some inevitability in humans, if baboons have the plasticity to do something like this. They don't have a leg to stand on. They're still the same now, 20 years later? Unfortunately, when the troops were moved into the vacuum created by the TB outbreak, they were moved into the lodge area and they disintegrate as a troop. Some got habituated enough to humans, which represents some danger and the park rangers killed about half of them. It gives you hope when it comes to humans. You see human cultures change. Like, in the 17th century the Swedes were terrorizing Europe. Now 200 years later they're civilized. Or. WW1 Christmas Truce in 1914. It only took 4 hours for British and German troops fraternizing from across the lines, when they supposed to be killing each other. And before over they were pratting together, having Christmas, playing soccer, exchanging addresses to meet after the war. Until the point some officers threatened to shoot them, unless they went back to try to kill each other. Or. Nowadays, there are travel agency only for veterans going to Vietnam for reconciliation ceremonies. And. All this behavior comes from free will, which is the biology we haven't discovered yet. Yes, and determinism. The frontal cortex it allows you to resist things. But why is yours the way it's haven't the big question. Yes, and some of that had to do with how stressed your mother was when you were fetus, like. Some on the level of sensory cues how that's influencing our behavior. Like just put a pair of eyes in a bus stop, and people litter less. Or put a pair of eyes in a computer and they become more generous in economic games. Because it's tapping into being watched. Put someone in a room with smelly garbage and they become more socially conservative on questionnaires. Because something feels disgusting. That biases us towards deciding what's different and what's wrong. People don't become more conservative about economic issues or geopolitical stuff. They're just disgusted by the garbage. A study looking at 5,000 judicial decision over a year on a parole board system. The biggest predictor of what decision our judge, if they're giving parole or not. It was how many hours have been since the judge had eaten the meal. Because when you got higher glucose levels in your bloodstream, your frontal cortex works better. And when you're hungry you feel less sympathy, empathy, generous. Doing the difficult frontal task of viewing the world from somebody else's perspective. So, a good society is keeping them well fed and low stress. Like when your stress learning and memory doesn't work well. Stress equals less empathic. You're more worried about your problems than the others. The part of the brain doesn't work well when stress hormones levels are elevated. What about the frontal cortex being damaged by a head trauma? They will know the difference between right and wrong. But cannot regulate their behavior. Like, 1840s. Phineas Gage. Part of his frontal cortex destroyed. Something wrong with the dynamite, and a 13-foot metal rod shot off one of his eyes, with part of the cortex and sent it 50 feet away. He turns into disinhibited crass sexually abusive bully. Never able to hold a job. You get dysregulation of volitional behavior. Because they can't regulate their behavior. Like 25 to 50 percent of the men on death row in USA. Have a history of concussive head trauma to the front of their heads. That's the contrary of lobotomy. Lobotomy was savaging about the front third of the brain, damaging the limbic emotion system. Developed by Agas Moniz. Nobel Prize of Physiology and Medicine 1949. In USA Walter Freeman. Created lobotomies where you would insert an ice pick behind somebody's eyeball go up through the optic cavity, and just scoop around and scrambling it. You shudder, my god, the things they didn't know only less than 70 years ago. I think 90% of people don't know how someone can do these impulsive terrible decisions, in a biological way. What's gives me hope is that people on the west have done that at least in a couple of realms. 
Now we make a biological statement. Oh, it's not him, it's his disease. Oh, he's not demonically possessed. You got something screwy with his potassium channels in his brain and once he gets synchronized outburst, he has a seizure disorder. Where words like justice, punishment, evil are irrelevant. It's a neurological disorder. We got a different mindset and took us about 500 years. Maybe another 250 years. Maybe somebody with paranoid schizophrenia, who in a delusional state did something violent. Maybe half of the teachers are able to know this kid isn't lazy, that's why they don't learn to read, in reality he has dyslexia. So, we are kinda in the right path. We see these things in television, crime, and punishment, and none of these factors being discussed as it's frustrating. It is. All the data we have it's from the last 50 years. We only can see it with humility before we think we understand the causes of the behavior. We have no clue of the actual biology there. And we fill in those with invention that we have volition and free will. Have you seen this for an excuse or a defense for a crime? Like the Twinkie case. Yes, blood sugar levels. Also, severe premenstrual syndrome. Used in cases when a woman who committed violent crimes, high level of the warrior gene. A gene called Mao Alpha, monoamine oxidase alpha. It has something to do with neurochemistry of aggression. High rates of antisocial aggression, only if, the human was abused during childhood. So, the gene is determining zero, you're getting a gene environment interaction. The absence of an abusive childhood having this gene variant has zero impact on this behavior. In India they used fMRI to determine someone's knowledge of a murder and they convinced the woman and made her guilt of it. Basically, there's no science for that. And the warrior gene how was someone been exonerated? I think it was court in Italy. The defense made an argument genetically predisposed. Isn't Italy the place where they charged scientists with not being able to register when an earthquake was coming? Yes, by assuring the public there wasn't an earthquake. So, it's in these less informed areas where these things had happened, it's dangerous. Yeah, be careful what you wish about people learning more about science. Yeah ha ha ha, mighty scary.